So, we're here to claim our inheritance. It's one of my props. You this stuff? Mmm, I love it. I love it. I know some of you are going to feel uncomfortable with me doing this. Because you're thinking, I didn't come here to see someone make love to money. <laughs> right? So what if I brought out my five-year-old grandsons and held them out to you and say, oh, he's lovely. You think, oh, that was nice. That's lovely. Well, what is this stuff? It's like anything, isn't it? It's all energy. We're energy. It's energy. And if we're not loving it, and loving our things, and loving our surroundings, then they decay around us. And if we're not loving money, we keep it away from us. We push it, we actually push it away from us. And so while money is not everything, I, I believe it's pretty close up there next to oxygen. <laughs> what do you think? It's the thing that allows us to do, to be, to go places. A few years ago, not so many years ago, I couldn't have just said, when Bill said, come over, I would have gone, I can't do it, I don't have the money. How many of you are doing that sometimes, with things? I can't do that, I haven't got the money. So opening yourself up to a possibility that we actually do live in this amazing, abundant, universe that wants to actually fulfill your desires. That's, that's what we're claiming here. So how about, I am a rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper now. Do you like that? Yes. Say it with me. I am a rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper now. And we were looking at prosperity yesterday, and it's not just money, is it? It's that whole feeling of well-being. It's our health. It's our relationships. It's the way we walk through the world. It's so much broader. And yet money is such an important part of that. It gives us such an ease. Mary Morrison talks about it as in terms of having, if you, if you need enough, so that you can be comfortable enough to be creative, to do what you love to do. Does that make some sense? Yeah. So it's not about having gazillions. You know, some people say, well, you know, if only you know, I win the lottery and I'll be set. No, because do you know what you're going to do with all that? Do you have the consciousness to deal with it? So it's about knowing what you want to do with your life. And then stepping into that, and the universe will greet you and rush to meet you and provide the means for that. I am the rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper now. Doesn't that feel, make you feel alive? Yeah, I love that idea. So what I'm inviting you to do today is that is to listen for an idea. Remember Myrtle Fillmore, co-founder of Unity? If it wasn't for her, she went to a, she went to a talk in the 18, late 1800s. And it, they, you know, that's what you did in the evenings. Then you didn't go off to movies and stuff. You went to talks. So she goes to this talk with her husband, Charles. And she hears these words. It was a metaphysical talk by E.B. Weeks, Dr. E.B. Weeks. We don't know a lot about him. But he says that during that talk, you are a child of God, therefore you do not inherit sickness. That one phrase is the foundation of everything that we have. 
in the unity movement. It's because she worked with that idea for two years. How many of you have persisted with working with an idea for that length of time? She totally healed herself. She was within six months of dying. That's how sick she was with tuberculosis. I think she was looking for some answers. Yeah. When I was looking for answers, when I was badly in debt, couldn't pay my credit card bills, horrible state of mind with my child where I was yelling at her all the time, in a stressful job, stressful relationship, toxic relationship in fact, I was looking, for, I started to look for answers and that was the first time I came to Melbourne. I came to a loving relationships training here with Sandra Ray. And I heard there this phrase, I don't remember anything else about that whole weekend, but I heard this. Blame is always off the track. Blame is always off the track. Trying to blame another or yourself. And suddenly you go, whoa, if I can't blame her, which is what I was doing to my daughter for a while, you know how we can sometimes think that our kids are willful? Well, she was probably thinking it's about time that that willful mother of mine got sorted. So I had to think, okay, so if blame is always off the track, then I've got to let that stuff go. I've got to let those ways of looking at what's going at dynamic. And you know, that transformed our relationship. Totally changes. So, by me letting go of any idea that I was to blame or she was to blame, change that whole thing. So hear an idea, see if there's something that you would, you could grab, that you could work with. I mean, if, that's if you have an area of your life you want to change. I mean, you might be peachy, all good. <laughs> Nothing you want to change. But some of you might have some things around money, relationships, work, what else, health, some other matter. So if there is something, pay attention. Mary Morrissey talks about honouring our longings and our discontent. You don't put up with, you don't have to put up with. You, if you honour it, so it's not that you try and push it away, but you honour it. It's what is it telling you to do? It's saying there's more for you. There's more of you to express as God in this world. See, if I hadn't listened to my discontent about my life, what would, be, what would I be doing now? I don't know. Grumpy old woman somewhere. <laughs> Continuing to say that, you know, it was that child of mine, I don't know, I'd be harping on the same old story, I guess. And you know, sometimes the old story keeps coming out, doesn't it? Ba -da, ba -da, it's wound, it keeps going. And so, you know, maybe it's time to look at those old stories. Do, they, do we need to keep running the same old tape? Or is there a new story? So, an old professor posed this question to the class, so I'll pose it to you. So a man dies with $10 million. The estate is to be divided in the following fashion. One-fifth goes to the son, one-fifth goes to the daughter, a sixth goes to the wife, and the rest goes to his sister. What do they all get? Someone put their hand up and said, a lawyer. <laughs> And so often, our inheritance issues end up in the hands of lawyers, don't they? Oh, you don't have that here? Does that not happen? Mm, okay. And, you know, issues. You know, why, why do we have to get a lawyer involved? Because there is, a, in fact, part of our inheritance is that we can claim divine justice, divine order. And when you start to claim that, 
because it was Charles Fillmore who said, your inheritance is divine ideas. That's your inheritance, divine <laughs> ideas. So there's always an idea there that you can, you can claim and that will actually bring to you the good that is yours, the good that's waiting for you, the good that's there. Nothing more you need do. I know in my family, I got, grew up five, there were five of us, and we used to, um, always at the dinner table, there would be um, a few other waifs and strays, and then people would be there for a meal as well, and so you look at the, you know, the food that mum had prepared, and there was a, a saying, it was FHB, you have that one? Family hold back. And so the guests would get to feast first, and it was like, oh, but is there going to be enough for us when we're growing kids? I mean, I think our grace was two, four, six, eight, bog in, don't wait. But so there's always that underlying anxiety, you know, when I think about things going to lawyers, is that, that underlying idea that the, somehow there's a lack, somehow there's not enough. And that's certainly what I grew up with. And I can see, you know, that in that environment, where in fact we did have plenty, but there was this underlying anxiety that there's not enough, somehow there's not enough. And we see it, don't we, with the whole way in the news. Countries are going broke. They, they talk about, they borrow money. This whole idea that somehow there's not enough. And the work that we were doing yesterday with the Lynn Twist book, The Soul of Money, she talks about this, a great lie is this one about the not being enough. In fact, there is sufficiency. There is enough in the world. Enough for everybody. Enough for everybody. But we have to be the ones to do the work to claim it for ourselves. And so, as each of us do that, and we step into who we really are, and offer that gift to the world, then we know that we're helping to lift the consciousness. Because we don't want, there's no point in trying to keep everyone down at the same level, is it? So, we, I guess, we all want to make a difference. We all want to make a difference in the world. Would that be true? That everyone's wish? Yeah. And so, the, we have to therefore work on ourselves to open ourselves up to that knowing that, yeah, I am a rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper now. Prosper in all ways. There's a quote from Matthew, Matthew 5, 5, the meek shall inherit the earth if it's all right with the rest of you. Because that's usually how we think about meek, isn't it? It's holding back, it's not claiming anything. But in fact, did you know that in unity, meek metaphysically means anyone who is highly trained to react to all negativity with love instead of with an eye for an eye. React to all negativity with love. And I was intrigued with that idea. And I, I was, um, we moved back from the States to New Zealand in March of last year, and back to our house that we'd had before. And I'd forgotten this habit of our neighbor. And what you have to picture here is that we live on the side of a hill, on a cliff. And our neighbor's house is down a bit down the hill. And his chimney comes up and it's right at the level of our deck. And what he does once a week is burn his rubbish. So it doesn't matter how hot the day is, so this fire is burning away there, and the smoke comes zooming across and winds its way into our house. 
lovely. And it was, it was horrible. And you know, we were back a few weeks and we thought, oh, I'd forgotten that he does this. Oh, that's horrible. Burning my eyes, getting, you know, in the back of my throat. And you were starting to build up a big lot of negativity around Barry and his fire. And so, you know, there were all these kind of daggers going over the deck. And I thought, oh, meet this negativity with love instead of eye for an eye, you know, because it felt like yelling at him. And so I started this and enrolled John in this as well. I thought, well let's just send him some love beams over the, over the deck. And, you know, it was amazing. The result, the way that changed, what happened was that a few weeks later we were having dinner up at um, our stepson and Barry was there and he said to us, does my burning rubbish bother you? Now, in the ten years, nine and a half years we'd been away, all our tenants had complained about this and Barry had been spoken to on numerous occasions. Didn't change a thing. Only after we'd started sending these love beams over the deck did he actually ask, does my burning rubbish bother you? And we said, yeah, actually it does. And he said, oh. We said, why don't you put it out in the recycling anyway? He said, no, no, I want to burn it. But, but what he does now is he calls me up. Are you going to be home? <laughs> and if I'm home, he doesn't do it. Or he, I say, Friday, I'm out. <laughs> right, he's going to burn rubbish on Friday. It's amazing the things that you can turn around. Is there any issue here that we could send love beams? Maybe. Maybe you've got something in your life or going on that you, where you could send some of that stuff, that good stuff. Yeah. There was a seminary professor who was vacationing with his, his wife. Gatlinburg, is that say it right, Doug? Gatlinburg, Tennessee? Yes. So one morning they were eating breakfast in a little restaurant, hoping to enjoy a quiet family meal. And while they were waiting for their food, they noticed this distinguished looking gentleman going around from table to table. And the, and the professor leaned over to his wife and said, oh, I hope he doesn't come over here. Anyway, but sure enough he did. Yeah, so, where are you fro folks from, he asked in a friendly voice, and he said, Oklahoma. Great to have you here in Tennessee. He said, what do you do for a living? And the professor replied, well, I teach at a seminary. He said, oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? I've got a great story for you. And with that, he pulled up a chair, and the professor's groaning, thinking, oh, no, here we go, another. Mm. <clears throat> the man started, he said, see that mountain over there? Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up because every place he went, he was always asked the same question. Hey boy, who's your daddy? Whether he was at school, in the grocery store, drugstore, people would ask the same question. Who's your daddy? He hated it. He'd hide at recess, didn't want to go out anywhere. It was, it, this question hurt him. Now when he was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church. He'd always go in late, slip out early to avoid hearing the question, who's your daddy? But one day the new preacher said the benediction so fast he got caught and had to walk out of the crowd. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher, not knowing anything about him, put his hand on his shoulder and asked him, son, who's your daddy? The whole church went quiet, deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Now everybody would finally know the answer to the question, who's your daddy? This new preacher though sensed the situation and using discernment that only the Holy Spirit could give said the following to the scared little boy. Wait a minute, I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. 
The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said, isn't that a great story? And the professor responded that it really was. As the man turned to leave, he said, you know, if that new preacher hadn't told me that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned. They called the waitress over and asked her, do you know who that man was who just left that was sitting at our table? The waitress grinned and said, of course, everybody here knows him. That's Ben Hooper. He was the former governor of Tennessee. You're a child of God. Claim your inheritance. God bless you. Thank you.